As Doctor Who's 60th anniversary draws near, I and countless other fans have been speculating as to the nature of David Tennant's temporary return to the role. After all, the main reason the franchise has lasted so long is because of its malleability, changing and adapting practically any aspect of itself to keep up with the times. The only things that are really sacred are the TARDIS and the Doctor themselves, the former of which acts as a literal vehicle to bring us into a story regardless of time or place, and even the latter has changed over a dozen times. Old Doctors returning is nothing new, David Tennant even did it for the 50th. But returning as the incumbent? This has never happened before. For many, this is unambiguously a good thing. The Tennant era was the zenith of the series' popularity in the UK, so much so that the BBC were seriously considering ending the show when Tennant and then-showrunner Russell T. Davies decided to move on, feeling that without David Tennant, people wouldn't be interested in watching anymore. It was only thanks to Davies that they were convinced to let it go on. And yet, despite this era and the Tenth Doctor's popularity, nearly 14 years later, fans are still heavily divided on its conclusion, the end of time. It seems that for every person who hails it as a brilliant and epic send-off for one of the best incarnations of the Doctor, there's another decrying it as being an overindulgent, ego-stroking mess, purpose-built to make the audience reluctant to see whatever comes next. I personally fall a bit in the middle, though erring towards the latter. The end of time is definitely a mess, but I find it to be an intriguing meditation on death and change, even if it doesn't quite come together in the end. So as we await David Tennant's return in November, I decided to revisit his regeneration story with the intent of examining what it does with these themes, where it fits into the show's overall theme of change, and the impact this has on a metatextual level. And it's a bit of a doozy. Change and death are integral aspects of the story which are plainly visible in its major players in addition to the Doctor, the Master, and Rassilon. The Master, who died at the end of Series 3, has been brought back to life by a group of cultists, but due to his wife's interference, the resurrection was botched and now he needs to constantly take in energy, be it through consuming food or people, to stay alive. But this is a woeful existence. As he himself puts it, this body was born out of death. All it can do is die. So when billionaire Joshua Naismith captures him to repair an alien medical device so he can make his daughter immortal, the Master seizes the opportunity to apply his own genetic template to the entire human race, thus turning them into copies of himself, or as he calls them, The Master Race. The Master, in his desperation to avoid death, was reduced to little more than a starving beast, devouring whatever and whoever he could just to survive. Humans never meant much to him, but now their lives had a specific purpose. Their batteries. And when he's brought on to work on the Immortality Gate, he uses it to further avert his own demise by turning all of humanity into extensions, exact copies, of him. So averse to death or change that he would turn an entire species into more of him for the sake of some perverse preservation. And when he figures out that the drumming in his head was put there as part of a Time Lord plot to evade their own demise in the Time War, he sets his sights on inflicting a similar fate to his own people. With over six billion masters amplifying the signal that the Time Lords put in the master's head as a child, the four drum beats, Rassilon is able to drag not just the Time Lords and Gallifrey, but literally everything from the war out of the time lock that kept it all sealed. Rassilon plans to deal with all of these horrors that would otherwise destroy the Time Lords by initiating a final sanction that would effectively bring all of creation, including time itself, to an end, leaving only the Time Lords, who would become beings of pure consciousness. All of creation means nothing to Rassilon when weighed against his own life, even if the life he would have would be incorporeal in every conceivable way. Of course, the Master had been the Doctor's archenemy for nearly 40 years by the time this story was produced, and his mortality and desperation to cling to life had been made effervescent parts of his character all the way back during Tom Baker's time in the TARDIS. In fact, the majority of the character's on-screen existence at this point featured him using someone else's body because he had burned through all of his regenerations, so his goals here are more or less par for the course for him. Rassilon, however, was much more of an enigma in the TV show up to this point, and I stress, in the TV show. 
I am very much aware that he was already treading down this morally repugnant path in expanded media. Eight's my favorite doctor. I've listened to the Divergent Universe arc. You do not need to leave comments telling me that there's precedent. But we're looking specifically at the TV show because, as big of a Doctor Who fan as RTD is, he also knew that a reliance on such deep cuts could alienate the audience. Until now, Rassilon has been little more than a ghost, one of the founders of Time Lord Society, but aside from a brief appearance at the end of The Five Doctors, he had no actual presence among his people. He seems to have been brought back during the war and made Lord President for the sake of preserving Gallifrey, and the war may be what turned him into this blithering lunatic. But his characterization is purposeful, not just to have a bigger, badder villain than the Master for the sake of having an over-the-top climax, but because he's meant to give credence to the Doctor's musings about Time Lord morality correlating to their lifespan. Sometimes I think a Time Lord lives too long. And this comes from his own lived experience. The 2009 specials, The Waters of Mars in particular, show the Doctor at what he sees as his lowest point. With no companions or Time Lords to reel him in, he tries to assert himself as the sole arbiter of the laws of time, the Time Lord Victorious. It doesn't go well, and he's still pretty shaken up about it. Plus, by then he had already been told that he was going to die, which was also very likely weighing on him. In this story, he reflects on how he's changed over time, how he isn't really the paragon of virtue he would like to believe. I've taken lives. I got worse, I got clever. Manipulated people into taking their own. In other words, he's a bit of a hypocrite, and he knows it. This personal reflection is what leads him to ponder whether Time Lords grow more cruel over time because of their advanced lifespans and unique perspective of time. That, as their final death draws nearer, they begin to prioritize self-preservation above all else. Now it should be noted that I am looking at this story within the context of when it was originally broadcast. So that means no War Doctor, and whether the journey's end regeneration counted as part of the Doctor's cycle was still ambiguous. Regardless of whether the latter actually counted at the time, however, the fact remains that this wasn't written with the idea that the Doctor's regeneration at the end of the story would be the twelfth and final one of his cycle. That idea came later. Despite this, like Rassilon and the Master, the Doctor is also averse to the idea of death. Sure, he'll regenerate, but it's something he's not exactly keen on. Even if I change, it feels like dying. Everything I am dies. Some new man goes sauntering away, and I'm dead. Let's put a pin in this for now, it's merely the surface layer of another aspect of the end of time, which has been subject to endless controversy since it originally aired, a subject which we will discuss in due course. Between our three major players, the Doctor's speculation as to the cruelty potential of someone facing their own mortality holds true. He even breaks the big no-guns rule that he adopted in the modern series when he figures out that the Time Lords are coming back, knowing that everyone and everything, not just his own life, is on the line. But there is a fourth player in the mix here, one who actively sought out the Doctor at the start of the story. Wilfred Mott. Wilf has a very different outlook on death than the others, despite also being an old man who is nearing the end of his own life. Unlike the others, he doesn't fight against it. He doesn't try to justify why he should continue living at the expense of others. He even says so himself. He's had his time. He's lived a long, fulfilling life. And more to the point, he's ready to put his life on the line to save just a single person. And unlike the Doctor, the Master, or Rassilon, Wilf has never taken another person's life. Even when he was a soldier in the bloodiest conflict in human history, he never killed anyone. After having the Tenth Doctor forego a companion for several episodes, the role would be filled by Wilf for his final outing. The two hadn't interacted all that much before now, but Wilf knew who the Doctor was and had tremendous respect and adoration for him. He showed his granddaughter so many wondrous things and did the best he could to save her life at the end of their travels, even if it meant she could no longer remember the Doctor or their time together. But their dynamic is something entirely different from any Doctor companion teams that had come before or have come since. It's not a teacher-student relationship, nor is it simply friendship. It's a father-son relationship. 
This is even highlighted a couple times in the dialogue. Oh, your dad's still kicking up a fuss. Yeah, well, I'd be proud if I was. I'd be proud. Of what? If you were my dad. This is all in service to the Doctor's arc in the story. That change isn't something to be feared, and that he should be ready to put his life on the line for the sake of those who are in mortal peril, as he's always done. The only difference here is that his death was prophesied by the Ood over a dozen episodes ago, and since then he's been actively evading the four knocks that would spell his doom. But the lesson is learned in a roundabout way. Wilf doesn't encourage the Doctor to stick to his principles and sacrifice himself for the greater good. He begs him to take his old service revolver and just shoot the Master. Wilf doesn't want the Doctor to die. The very thought turns him into a blubbering mess. Which is why he wants the Doctor to take the gun. To drop the pretense of being a moral paragon. Stop the bad guy, save the world, and live to tell the tale. It's only when the stakes are raised further that the Doctor actually takes him up on it. And when the moment arrives, he's ready to pull the trigger. It's just a matter of who he'll shoot. And then… Apotheosis. The Doctor makes eye contact with a Time Lady who had been covering her face in shame for voting against Rassilon's wishes. And instead of taking a life, he shoots the machine that amplified the signal to pull the Time Lords here, thus sending them back into the war. The Master, enraged at how his life had been tampered by his own people as part of their own self-preservation plot, follows them in to wreak vengeance. Who is this woman who continuously popped up throughout the story? Well, Davies had conceived her as the Doctor's mother, but she's never identified at all in the episode. But given that she pled to Wilf for help, how she was made to bear witness to Rassilon's grand plan despite voting against it, and how seeing her led to the Doctor reconsidering murder, we can instead read her as being a representative of the innocent people the Doctor always strives to protect. So that's it then. The day is saved, humanity is back to normal, the Master and the Time Lords have been defeated, and best of all, the Doctor is still alive. Until... <laughs> After all that, the Doctor is directly confronted with his own mortality. And unlike your typical prophecy story, its fulfillment isn't predetermined. The Doctor has the choice of leaving Wilf to die a horrible death, and the old man even tells him that it's okay. He's had his time. He willingly stepped in there to save someone else's life. He knew getting in there was dangerous. The Doctor throws a bit of a tantrum over this, how after everything he just went through, his reward is still to die. All to save a single, insignificant old man. But it's not fair! And he's right, it isn't fair, but he gets himself together, mumbling about how he's lived too long. This is the moment of truth. Does he confirm his theory that Time Lords turn cruel when they've lived for too long? Or does he stick to his principles and give up his life to save just one person? Wilfred, it's my honor. The Doctor sacrifices himself, fulfilling the prophecy he had been so dreading. Because more than anything else, he's the Doctor. When given the choice, he will always save every life he can. And this is when it all falls apart. I'm sure you all know what happens next. The Doctor goes on his farewell tour, stopping by to see all of his friends and companions from the Davies era before finally, 20 minutes later, he regenerates while tearfully uttering, I don't want to go. Now there are two ways you can look at all of this. First, there's the intended interpretation of getting to see all of these characters one last time before the new Doctor and production crew take over. It's long, overindulgent, and very much playing to the feels, but ultimately harmless. Then there's the far more cynical and unintentional reading. This is the end, folks. Doctor Who isn't going to be the same anymore. Matt Smith stole the role from Tennant, and you should be upset about that. Don't give him a chance. This reading is compounded by both the Doctor's comments about regeneration early in the story... Some new man goes sauntering away, and I'm dead. ...and the tantrum he threw before sacrificing himself for Wilf. But it's not fair! And I understand why some fans see it this way. It doesn't help that Ten's final line is borderline antithetical to his arc in the story. I say borderline because, when writing fiction, there's a simple principle of want versus need, i.e. the characters may have to give up what they wanted at the beginning of the narrative in order to attain or learn what they actually need. They're not always mutually exclusive, and not every story has them, but in the end of time, the Doctor has both. 
He wants to avoid dying, but he needs to remain true to who he is. And that requires putting the lives of others before his own, which he does. He experiences a complete character arc in this story, but... I don't want to go. It doesn't feel like it. It also doesn't help that Ten's reticence to regenerate is totally opposite of literally every other incarnation's attitude towards it, and runs counter to its metatextual significance. Christopher Eccleston leaving the show after only one series was a shame, but the silver lining there was that Davies could introduce regeneration to new viewers early enough that they wouldn't be totally blindsided by a new actor taking the role. The Ninth Doctor's regeneration was handled with tremendous care, walking the audience through the particulars and emphasizing above all else that, even if the face and mannerisms change, it's still the same character. It's still the Doctor. And it was after Eccleston's regeneration that we got David Tennant, the most popular incarnation of the character even to this day. So why are their regenerations framed so differently? The most likely answer is probably that it's more dramatic. That the Doctor goes through an arc, but it entails the exact opposite of what he wanted. It's ironic melodrama, and it's the culmination of the story's theme of change being necessary, even good, even if we don't like it. I don't want to go. And it plays fantastically well to the emotions of those who were invested in this Doctor and RTD's run on the show, but it and the farewell tour also feel so detrimental to the episode's storytelling and themes, because while the Doctor stuck to his principles, he's still acting like he hasn't learned anything. I don't want to go. Does that, in and of itself, make the end of time a bad story? Maybe. Maybe not. I'm not here to declare whether thing good or thing bad. I don't like this story, and I especially don't like the Tenth Doctor. Of all the numbered incarnations, he's dead last in my book. Not because of David Tennant, who I actually really like as an actor, but because of how the character is written. And while I won't air out all of my grievances here, I can point to everything going on with him in this story as contributions to my distaste. Which I'm sure is also true for plenty of others who aren't particularly fond of this Doctor, but after rewatching it I have gained a bit of appreciation for him, even if he's still absolute bottom tier for me. But I digress. The end of time is… messy. For a lot of reasons. Change is necessary, and we aren't always going to like it when it happens. But this is Doctor Who, the show that has only survived for 60 years because it's so readily embraced change. Yet, End of Time, despite trying to be a celebration of the revived series up until now while also imparting the message that change isn't bad, This song is ending, but the story never ends. Instead ends up projecting the idea that the show's glory days are over, and that it's all downhill from here. I don't want to go. And sure, there have been some rough patches since then, but there have also been some tremendous highlights. The show's still going, and the future is looking bright.